very much, Susanna, and thank you so much for um, for coming this evening on what is a cold February evening to come and uh, talk about Brexit, the issue which seems to keep on giving, sadly. Um, but what I thought I would do is give you um, an overview, really, of what was happening in the European Parliament, and maybe give, some, give you some of my own um, thoughts and personal perspective on what is happening. I'm sure there'll be some questions about what's happening with the Labour Party as well, so I'm happy to answer um, those too. But um, I want to be very, very clear from a very personal perspective that I am against Brexit, and I'll do all that I can to shine a light on the consequences of what I believe is um, is going to be one of the biggest disasters our country has ever had um, to face. I think that um, issues around um, what is going on are so important to discuss, and that's why events like this are absolutely critical. So come as no surprise to you, many of you, many of you in this room, that many of my colleagues in the European Parliament uh, look on our country in absolute disbelief at what is happening in the United Kingdom. How could a stable democracy in the UK end up in a mess in such a short space of time? Uh, how can the UK government, for example, propose Henry VIII clauses when this is 2018 and not 16th century England? How can the UK government prevent British MPs from seeing documents. Um, and I want to, to share with you this evening that one of the uh, big uh, things for, for MEPs has been uh, impact assessments. And the Conservative MEPs in the European Parliament will not see any... Sorry? We're going to have to stop this. All right, stop it. There you go. I think what's on me already. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the Conservative MEPs for over a decade have insisted on the smallest piece of legislation that there is a thorough impact assessment. Everything has to have an impact assessment. So I find it particularly galling that on this issue of Brexit, which is so critical to every part of our economy and society, that our very elected people are only allowed to see impact assessments in a locked room. I think the MSPs are now allowed to see them, but they've got to go to the Scottish office into, I think, a locked room as well. And I put up on Twitter, the MEPs haven't really been allowed to see them at all. So maybe this is something we need to put a bit of pressure on. But this issue about impact assessments and something so critical to our country and its future, um, I just really find quite extraordinary. Um, the other issue is that my colleagues in the European Parliament read our newspapers and often uh, and regularly watch the BBC, where you know some members of the British government call openly the EU the enemy. And that uh, this kind of rhetoric is not only alarming, but illustrates to, that, to many that the UK has really lost the plot when it comes to what we're talking about in Brexit. So, you know, I always thought that governments were meant to look after their people, to act in the people's interests. And to my colleagues in the European Parliament, the fact that the UK government has no real plan. And we've seen this with the Cabinet meeting, and still there's no real plan. And we are now almost um, a year after triggering, triggering Article 50 um, and, uh, and we still don't know what the plan is. What we do know are some statements. We know that the, the, the Prime Minister is talking about leaving the single market, leaving the customs union, which even in their own assessments is, a, is going to be economically uh, detrimental. What is it, 2% GDP if you leave the single market and customs union? Uh, and that was the best, worst option of the options that were put out. Um, and so you look at this and you think, we know this is going to damage people's jobs, people's livelihoods, uh, especially leaving the single market and the customs union. Um, so how are we in this situation of creating such an act of self-harm to our own country and for what gain? And don't believe that anyone in the EU, uh, in the UK, uh, and people in the EU look at this, that no one in the UK in the referendum wanted to make themselves poorer or their families poorer. Yet everything that we see about what is happening with Brexit will, 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 will make our country poorer. And the very people who seem to me to be pushing for the hardest Brexit possible will never be touched by the economic consequences. Yesterday I was um, addressing a group of shop stewards from um, Unite, uh, shop stewards in Glasgow, and they have got this Brexit roadshow that's going on for the, the, the next month. I think it's, the next, it's certainly the next two weeks, if not the next month to talk about it so that their union will have a, a, a position on it. And it was really interesting yesterday. I wasn't sure what I was going to get with questions and 
yet you know there is such alarm and also real questions about gender about equality about women's voice in some of this as well which i had really young people i mean it was just a huge amount of issues and and, and it was really really good to have that kind of conversation and equality in the debate but back to the european parliament the european parliament will have a yes or no vote on the withdrawal agreement it will also have a vote and whatever our future relationship will be with the EU. Sadly, MEPs from Britain will no longer be there, but that will be actually voted upon. But MEPs, British MEPs, will have a vote, on a yes or no vote, on the withdrawal agreement. So where are we? So we know that there was um, a, a decision made in December that we could move on from the kind of first, uh, first um, tranche, first phase, which involved three things which involved citizens' rights, which are absolutely critical to the European Parliament's uh, approval of the final agreement. You had the issue around money, which although it wasn't the money aspect in terms of a, a figure, I think uh, people all think it's about 50 billion, but the money aspect in terms of the divorce settlement. And then the question of Northern, Northern Ireland. Um, um, I mean, the question of Northern Ireland in, in the in what was agreed in phase one was interesting because on one hand it talks about full regul full, full alignment of regulation, but on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the government isn't wanting to be part of a customs union. So how are you able to kind of square that circle? I heard one extraordinary academic who is just phenomenal when it comes to issues around borders. She's at Queen's University, uh, Belfast. And she made the, the extraordinary um, uh, statement about how there are 200 farms across the border in Northern Ireland, 200 farms. A sheep doesn't know if it's in Northern Ireland or in Ireland. So how are you going to manage a border where you have different rules over how that sheep is regulated? And maybe, I don't know if some of you are aware about the animal welfare issues about sheep tagging and all of these things that we've had to grapple with in the European Parliament and have discussions about. But you're kind of thinking, is, is, is this really going to happen? That sheep will be regulated in different ways? And kind of how, how is that going to work? And how is that going to happen? And that's just about a sheep. Never mind all the other issues that are uh, affecting issues questioning around the border. But anyhow, the, the, the phase one negotiations, there was enough movement, enough progression in those for in December, the member states to say, right, we can now move on to phase two. So the European Parliament had a resolution. We always have resolutions when it comes to um, these big meetings where decisions are made and where Parliament's perspective has to be uh, recognised. And the interesting thing is that Michel Barnier knows that the European Parliament, he was an MEP, and, and he knows that the European Parliament will have this yes or no vote on this, this withdrawal agreement. He is responsible, and you know, he's given the responsibility from the EU side to negotiate. So he is never away from the European Parliament. In fact, one day where it would appear that everywhere I went, it was like somebody said, are you stalking Michel Barnier, Captain? Because everywhere you go, he is there. And he's taking this exceedingly seriously because he knows that if the European Parliament says no, there will be no agreement. There has to be agreement from the Parliament. So <clears throat> there was a resolution voted in December, which the Parliament gave an overwhelming agreement to move on to the second phase. But the first phase isn't over with because nothing is agreed till it's all agreed. And the fact is that you see questions still being raised about Northern Ireland. You see issues raised about citizens' rights and not enough clarity about what some of this means. And then in the divorce bill as well, you know, yes, 50 billion, but when will that happen? How will it, what will it cover? Probably the financial year to 2020, which covers possibly any transition, but that's not all agreed absolutely yet. So we are now in this phase two negotiation. The, the, the heads of governments will be meeting in the next few weeks. The parliament will have its next resolution, which means we've only got a six month window really now to get this withdrawal agreement together. It took us that long to talk about Northern Ireland, the citizens' rights and the divorce, and we still have yet to be absolutely clear about the hand. What is going to happen in the next six months is absolutely critical. And I, um, I, I kind of, I, I put together kind of few different scenarios which could happen. So I thought I'd share with that because actually at the moment, all we can do when it comes to Brexit is scenario plan because we don't know. The, a lady yesterday said to me, "So what's going to happen with the European Social Fund?" She was in a college in Glasgow, and I was like, "Well, you know, once we're out, there's no social fund. <laughs> However, if you're in an EAF arrangement." You know, the Norwegians do, do give money into a social fund of sorts, not maybe for the, the, the more kind of prosperous countries, but for certainly countries 
who have need. So there are examples which are not fully EU members, but where there is, but she's saying, you know, she's going into a meeting today and they wanted clarity about their social funding. And although they'll probably get it to 2020, after that, how are they going to replace certain funding that they have been used to or been able to uh, to apply for? Anyway, so if we look at some of the scenarios as we move towards the March head of government's meeting and the Parliament's resolution, we can think of kind of, so the EU27 want to know what the UK government wants in terms of its future relationship. And as such, all we can tell from what the UK government is saying is it doesn't want the single market, doesn't want the customs union, which begs the question then, what does the UK government actually want? And so moving in the next two weeks, we need to be far clearer about what that means. And also, it is not clear yet, and that's what Michelle Garney said about transition. People here seem to think we will automatically have a transition period. But that isn't set in stone, that is part of the negotiation. So, you know, moving forward, you know, a transitional timescale will only be agreed if the EU27 agree. And so the transitional arrangement is not done and dusted. Then we have issues over, um, you know, the next negotiating round, which need to be progressed um, in terms of other issues where, where we're looking for what the trade agreement is. But it's also about, you know, we hear a lot of talk about security. We hear a lot about how we want to have security cooperation. We want to have this, we want to have that, which then begs again the question of why are you leaving the EU in the first place when you get all this as full members? And also the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking because come the, the, what, the 29th of March 2019, we are out uh, because we triggered Article 50 um, on the you know for that two year period, so the clock is ticking. We have to get some form of agreement, or else we'll be out on the 29th of March 2019 without a withdrawal agreement, without knowing where we're going as a as a third country with our closest neighbours being the EU, and then I believe the WTO standards or rules will then have to apply, and no one knows how that will actually work in practice. So to the scenarios, we might end up having a withdrawal agreement. The best case scenario, as it stands, um, well, in my opinion, would be not to leave the EU at all. But if it, that is not going to be a possibility, which I still think there's a long way to go in a year's time and a lot can happen in a year. But as it stands, if the withdrawal agreement is concluded and includes transitional arrangements, the UK will abide by all the rules the EU sets have no say on how those rules are shaped or set in those transitional years, and then we will have some form of UK-EU trade relationship that will be formed in that transitional time, um, and it it, there is possibility that a transitional arrangement wouldn't just be for two years, it would have to go on for some time, because if you look at, say, the Canadian trade agreement, that took 10 years to negotiate, and this, okay, we are much closer in terms of EU uh, regu regulatory alignment, but it will take time. Then you've got a situation where, you know, what if the UK Parliament rejects the withdrawal agreement? And, you know, Keir Starmer said in a Fabian speech in January that if the six points of the plan, which are basically amount to that this cannot be detrimental to jobs, well, it will be detrimental to jobs if we leave the European Union. So if the withdrawal agreement has in it that um, it will be, you know, you know the, the, the Labour Party decides that they could, you know, um, reject the withdrawal agreement. And so, therefore, if the withdrawal agreement is rejected, what then happens at that moment too? Then you've got the situation of the European Parliament possibly, as I was saying earlier, rejecting the withdrawal agreement. What happens in that scenario too? So all you can do at the moment in terms of thinking about scenarios and I guess finally, if one of the EU27 member states says the withdrawal agreement, even if they sign up to it, if you look at what happened in the Netherlands with something very simple like the Ukrainian agreement that was reached, and they had a, they had a referendum on it and it was rejected, you know, it, it could take one member state with looking at the withdrawal agreement to say, no, we don't think this is in, in their interest. So it's hugely complex, hugely risky, even moving forward with the withdrawal agreement. So. We're entering a time of great uncertainty, even more than before, because we do not know what life outside the EU really, really looks like. And if I take my experience, it sounds that I've served on the EAFTA delegation for 
good part of 15 years. So um, we have joint parliamentary committees with Norway, with Iceland, with Switzerland, plus the overall EA uh, issues are dealt with together as a delegation. So I'm vice chair of the Icelandic delegation and I'm on this EAFTA delegation um, too. So it's really interesting when you see the relationship with countries who have the closest possible relationship rather than being part of the EU. So to start off with, the EA was created as a fudge. Norway voted not to join the European Union and it was created in a way to allow some form of cooperation with Norway that allowed it to have access to the single market. So when you talk to Norwegians honestly about what the situation is in their country, the truth of the matter is to single market access, you have to abide by the rules of the European Union but have no real say over how they are set and you have to pay for that arrangement too. So it, that is the next option to full membership of the European Union where you have no say but have to still pay for the, the rights to be able to trade in the single market. Now, for the Norwegians and the Icelanders, there's still, I mean, there's, they have a really interesting, again, very fascinating way of looking at this relationship, a very open way. They look at this relationship, they actually produce documents, they debate it, they discuss it. I happened to go to the 2011 Norwegian Labour Party conference. Fascinating thing, there's a lot of singing at the Norwegian Labour Party conference, I think we should really adopt that in, in Scotland as well. It's a really great atmosphere. But this one, they had a debate about the fourth railway package of which they voted as their conference to reject. So this is not, a, they're not a full member, they're part of the AF you know, relationship, but they voted against the fourth railway package, which was a huge, huge problem because at that point their government was from the, the Labour Party. And I just thought, which other conference do you go to? We have that type of in-depth discussion and debate about something exceedingly specific, or was it but yeah, it's the fourth railway, not the fourth railway, it's the fourth poster. For that, that, that piece of law, they had the debate, debate discussion and, 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 and made a decision about it. And I thought maybe one of the challenges we've faced in our country for 40 years, we really haven't had debates and discussions in the same way as Norway has had to have that level of debate. And sadly, it's taking us now to leave the European Union where we actually are starting to have some of those debates. But anyway, the EAFTA relationship is, you know, if you're part of the EA, you're not part of the customs and you're part of the single market. So that's another, and obviously agriculture and fishing are not part of the agreement. But putting those to the side, you have access to the single market and it's a bespoke package that's there. So when I'm looking at all of the issues that are around and surrounding Brexit at the moment, I firmly believe we have to keep the EAF to option on the table if full membership of the EU is not a possibility, which I, I, I will campaign to say it, it should be a possibility, but if it is not a possibility, then the next option is the EAF to option. It's a bespoke deal, it's a bespoke relationship, it's sitting there and it could be used. And the fact at the moment that we should rule nothing out at the moment that the situation we find ourselves in uh, is something where I will keep pressing that the EAF option should be still remain on the table and I still uh, try and do so. So, um, I mean, how, how, to, how to sum up, I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary being an MEP at this time. Never did I think in the 19 years I'd be elected, I'd be standing in front of a group like yourselves today with us even thinking about leaving something that's so important to her. It's, it's not just, I mean, maybe our language that you use sometimes, but I so believe that the European Union is, a, is the most successful peace process that the world has ever known. The countries used to fight one another, work peacefully together. It's inspired. It's a genius of inspiration of how people got together and put, put differences aside and did something for the, the, the public good. And it's, it's something very precious. And for people in our country to talk about it in such demeaning ways, to put it down, to not see its value. And I find just, um, it's as though our country has gone back decades rather than forward. And we're not even questioning the fact that many of us are about to lose our EU citizenship, which we feel very strongly about. I was born in 1973, I'm 44 years old, and I have been a European citizen since I was born. And I'm about to lose something I believe is really, really extraordinarily precious. 
and the Taoiseach, the Irish Taoiseach was in the Parliament um, a few weeks ago, and he summed up that he, his niece and nephew are in London, and their kids are in a school in London. And he said, they're lucky, they've got their Irish citizenship, they'll always have their EU citizenship, but it's their friends at school, they'll no longer have EU citizenship, they'll no longer have the same rights as my niece and nephew that are sitting in that same school. And that, for me, he said, is the tragedy of Brexit. The fact that we're losing something really important and we will have, to, and we're not even having the conversation that we need to have about how or what we want our country to be, to look like, where we want it to go forward to. Because as it currently stands, everything about Brexit will make our country poorer, it will isolate our country, and it will be make, you know, my kids who are 11 and 6 will lose their EU citizenship for what? For a lie that went on a 350 million pound, well, 350 million lie that went on a red bus that went around the country by people who will never ever have to suffer the way the ordinary people in our country will suffer due to Brexit. Anyhow, I wish I'm normally quite a positive person, but you know, I'm finding it very hard to have anything. When I hear the word, there's an opportunity with Brexit, I find it, you must be absolutely joking. So I'm sorry I'm so negative, but I think I have to be because what we're facing is something so dark and so difficult that I think that we have to have that honest conversation and that's why your group and groups like you, I'm so proud and Fife as well, and I Fife for Europe as well, that we actually have those conversations and we come together and try and think of ways that we can move forward. So thank you so much for letting me come along and I'm happy to take any questions. I hope I didn't speak for too long because um, I wanted to hear what you had to say and we've got quite a small group, it's quite nice because we can have honest conversations and we can actually have an interesting debate. So thank you so much. <laughs>
that the UK government should be treating the Scottish government, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly. They should all be having these same cycles of negotiation so that we have alignment, as well as having everything publicly available, not MPs having to scuttle into locked rooms to see documents that are important for our future. <coughs> so, I mean, it's um, this four-week cycle is, 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 I mean, the other I should share with you, uh, talking to people from the EPP groups, so that's the European People's Party, the European Right, it looks as though Michel Barney could well be the European People, People's Party's candidate to be the special candidate for the European elections. So if they get more votes than any other political family group in the European elections, Michel Barney will be the next Jean-Claude Juncker, he'll be the next president of the European Commission. So when we're negotiating a trade deal with the European Commission, who will be our interlocutor <laughs> but Michel Barney? So, I mean, it's just... You know, we should we should think through some of the things that are happening and the way we speak and the way we talk. Um, really, <laughs> not you, but you know, <laughs> some of our very senior people really should um, take a lesson in social etiquette and uh, and and learn something about how to treat and speak to other people. So I, th I think that people, if the spirit wants to stop Brexit, you can, right? And I mean, I, that's part of the reason why I put my name to the court case in Article 50, because I thought that, that, you know, we need to get some clarity. It hasn't gone so well so far, but you've got to keep trying. But um, I mean, it's kind of clear to me that if you, if you want to stop it, it's up to the UK to stop it. But the clock is ticking because we have done this. But if you want to pull back, you can pull back. And that to me is very clear. Um, and some people think that because of the mess that's happening with it, you really should think about this because um, when people, I mean, if it, if it was a huge difference in the referendum, but this was such a close referendum and something which now, as it turns out, no one has an alternative to actually deal with this, which will actually ensure that our economy is protected yeah. and jobs will be, sa will be safe and that uh, things can go on in a way which we would like him to go on. And um, and that is something that we need to, you know, I, I, you're talking about going to be at Labour Party conference in Dundee. Well, we've got a friend of David Martin and I with Kirsty Hughes, which is putting the brakes on Brexit. So we have organised it and it's happening. And um, and I think that's something where we need to, I think my title is the good, the bad and the ugly. So <laughs> so uh, the good being those who are standing up and trying to put the whole truth to power the the bad are those who who really should know better, and uh, you know, and the ugly is really the the, the racism and the na that, that that type of you know kind of nastiness that really we don't want to see in our society. I I am trying, um, but. I think that, so there's a number of things. Keir Starmer, to be fair, has moved on the customs union and that took about a year, but at least that's happened. So that's a positive movement. But there will inevitably be this debate that will keep on going. Um, I mean, I'm gutted, if I'm honest with you, about where my party is at the moment because um, as a committed internationalist and European, um, I would hope that the Labour Party would ha be very, very much against Brexit and what is going on. Um, sadly, partly due to the politics of it, that seventy percent of Labour MPs were in vote areas where people voted to leave. Um, uh, that, that I think that this is part of the position, but also um, I think that there, the leadership at the moment is not, in, in terms of being pro-European, the way I see being pro-European. Or maybe not in that space, um, sadly. Um, but all you can do is keep on trying. And I think the fact that the policy forum this weekend, they actually got some movement that each committee had to have a Brexit coordinator. And that was down to the leadership of uh, Richard Corbett, who is the leader of the European Parliamentary Labour Party. So there is some movement. But um, I feel we could be much stronger. And at the moment, you know, a customs union, what does a customs union mean? Well, it's not full membership, and it's certainly not, you know, it's certainly not full membership, and it's certainly not not an EEF relationship, which allows you to 
also for citizens and for rights around those issues, um, it's also quite important. So um, all I can say to you is maybe invite Jeremy Corbyn to come to this meeting at some point and tell, ask him what his viewpoints are about how you can persuade him too. I'll keep trying and um, and there's a number of people who do keep trying, but I think part of the reason the, European, the Parliamentary Labour Party is where it is, is of how the vote panned out, particularly in England. I'm being honest with you, because I think it's better to kind of, rather than, you know, because I'm absolutely gutted at the moment about where we are, and I want us to change, and I will do what I can do while I'm still elected, which I think I'll still be elected for another year, so keep, keep fighting the good fight and trying. But it was interesting yesterday at the Unite meeting, very interesting that so many people were very committed to to Europe and for being part of the European Union is particularly in their workplaces and where they know that jobs will be put at risk if we leave the European Union as it looks like we're going to do. So I can't be more positive. I think that um, I hope that the leadership is listening to that movement because I think that is such a powerful voice because it's about those people's futures um, and it's about where they would like to be in the world that we are today because it's a global world that we exist within and being part of Europe helps us in that global world. Becoming more isolated will not. So you're absolutely right. The youth of our country, the movements that have been created and the ideas and the energy that young people bring to any campaign uh, is absolutely just so special and so important. Um, so I, as I say, I hope they will listen and I, and I also hope they have the space and the courage. You can change your mind. You don't have to be entrenched in things that maybe you have believed for so many years. You can actually have the space and at the moment we need people to come forward and say, you know, we need to put the brakes on this, we really do, because even their own economic assessment shows that people will be less will be less well off, that jobs will be put at risk, and for what? For the for, for the campaign, you know, of, of a small group of people who seem to be taking over the Conservative Party and who the Prime Minister seems to be being forced to listen to because they don't want a general I mean it's just how are we in this, and also, I mean, to call a general election and to then end up in a, a mess of what we see now. Um, so, just keep putting pressure. And I think many of us, certainly the Labour Party, who believe in the European Union, who are, who are committed Europeans, want the Labour Party to move its position to be forcefully anti this mess. You know, on the, the BBC issue, let's, let's think about it because I, I mean, the, the stuff about Nigel Farage being on question time all the time, and they're seeing, you know, and some people, I mean, in 90 years I've never been on it, and a number of MEPs, majority of British MEPs have never been on question time or never been asked to be on question time. Now, I see, I, I keep thinking then, is it those powers that then don't want you to watch the BBC? <laughs> or to challenge it because actually a public broadcaster is important and I might disagree with some of the things but not all of the things. So how do we, you know, because I, I'm, I, I, at the moment I'm very frustrated with the BBC on Brexit in particular. I feel that some of the coverage of it, it's very, it's, it's, it's very choice. Okay, people have to make decisions about this, but I think for some, I, I find that there's something where it was about the single market and the way they'd spun it, I thought, that's wrong, because it should be, a, but then the next hour it changed again. Now, we're living, and we've, we've faced it through this 24-hour news cycle, and, and we've never been, you know, what, 20 years ago, we didn't really have the 24-hour news cycle. Now, we don't just have the 24-hour news cycle, we've got Twitter, and we've got Facebook, and we've got social media, everything is changing. Mean, the way that we consume news, the way we look at it, but I still believe there's a space for a public broadcaster. And that's where I think that much my frustrations with the BBC, and I have some, I think that it's underpinning good is still there. And we have to put pressure on it in terms of, and that's why social media puts so much pressure on it. But you were talking about democracies, and I've just finished reading a book about, this is, this is 
this is maybe more a positive thing to kind of give you. But I've just finished reading that it's, an, it's a really, a, if you haven't had a look at it, it's about, its title isn't the most positive. It's about how democracies die, but it's also about how they're built back up again. And it's two academics from Harvard. And this is actually towards the end of the book. And it's, um, and I printed out because I thought, we're, I think we are thinking about what is democracy at the moment, because, well, I certainly am, I'm thinking about it because, well, about what's happening in the UK, what's happening in the EU, and this was written in the, kind of the darkest days of the Second World War, when America's very future was at risk, and as a writer, E.B. White, was asked by the US Federal Government Writers' War Board to write a short response to the question, what is democracy? And his answer was unassuming, but also was inspiring. He wrote, surely the board knows that democracy is, it is, sorry, I don't have my reading glasses on, I'm, I've started at 44 getting, getting the reading glasses, so you just have to bear with me. It is the line that forms on the right. It is the don't in don't shove. It is the hole in the stuffed shirt through which the sawdust slowly trickles. It's the dent in the high hat. Democracy is recurrent suspicion, though more than half of the people are right more than half of the time. It's the feeling of privacy in the voting booths, the feeling of communion in the libraries, the feeling of vitality everywhere. Democracy is a letter to the editor. Democracy is a score at the beginning of the ninth. It's an idea which hasn't been disproved yet, a song the words of which have not gone bad. It is the mustard on the hot dog, the cream in the ration coffee. Democracy is request from a war board in the middle of a morning, in the middle of a war, wanting to know what democracy is and to me that just I think that is quite inspiring because we have to be the idea of being tolerant of each other and somehow at the moment this mutual toleration and respect that we have in our democracy seems to be going seems to be for those of us who believe in the European Union sometimes I look at the way our debate is just now and I feel what is going on what is happening so I share that with you. That was a bit of a digression. I just happened to have that in my book there and I thought, well, I will, I will bring it out to share with you. But do read that book about how democracies die and how they're built back up because I think it does give you hope. But, but we are, I mean, we look at Brexit. Brexit didn't just happen overnight. In 2014, UK won the European elections. It was there, you know. People... Uh, you've had Nigel Farage and an MEP for 19 years saying how terrible the EU is and all of this, straight bananas, curved, Europeanised failure and nationalised success all the time for 40 years, whether it was Conservative, Labour governments, whoever. You know, there comes a moment when people are asked a simple question about something and people feel they're so disenfranchised, they've got no say in a democracy, they've got no, there's nothing that they can, when somebody tells them they can take back control, when they, three words, so effective, but you can take back control, people are going to do that. And in a referendum, where it's a very, very strange type of, of you know, that's, that's why referendums are illegal in Germany, because, you know, they're not going to have any risk of referendums and what they could do in a country that suffered so much after the, you know, the two wars. And it, it just is quite something that we are where we are today, and we need to take stock of that as well. I mean, some of the, it's interesting, I was interviewed by a, a student who had interviewed a number of MEPs, including UKIP, and he said to me, UKIP say they're going to protect Erasmus. And I was kind of like, how? We're leaving the European Union. This is the policy that they, you know, it's their very existence. How are we going to be part of Erasmus? And then Diana James stood up at a debate, I was, I, what was it on? It was something very innocuous. It was, um, I think it was the standards, or something, I can't remember. Anyway, she stood up and she didn't talk anything about the piece that was there. And she talked about higher education. And I, I thought, I'm just going to put my speech down because I have to say something. How can this individual talk about her commitment to students in higher education when her very party is denying our students the opportunity and also our universities? I think Scotland benefited 89 million across the board. And Kelly, you can correct me. 89 million for one year just for research funding across our higher education sector. That's been put at risk. Um, I know for a fact of one one student um, who is a friend who made a decision to go on Erasmus this year because she didn't know whether she would possibly get it the next year. 
And people are having to make those choices. And you can't, this is, you know, how can this be possible? Erasmus is a fantastic scheme. It's celebrating its 30 years in existence. It's a fantastic way that, sh that students can have an international experience and students, regardless of their income, can have an international experience and that is a transformational for people. Certainly people I know, it's transformed their lives. Some of them even met their future husbands and wives on Erasmus programmes. But um, I just, I, I, I have so much sympathy with what you're saying. And I think that don't say to students that they're going to have Erasmus after Brexit. Unless something is negotiated, okay, probably the transition, you probably still have Erasmus programmes fun functioning, probably. If we have a transition, if we don't have a cliff edge. But in the future, our choice to leave the European Union has huge, huge consequences. If you're a third country, I think you can pay into get research funding, but you don't have the benefits that we have at the moment. We are, we are leading, we actually do so well out of European research grant, and it's unbelievable, especially in Scotland, how well we have done. And this vote will put that all at risk. The, the, do you know they did this week, daily politics programme? And on a Friday, once a month, they were to have MEPs. And so that was always, you know, they, they, they tried to do a little bit of that. I know that BBC Scotland have been in touch with me. They're coming out on the 28th of March to do a programme to mark the year in of the Article 50. And I guess in Radio Scotland, they have been a bit better with MEPs, to be fair. But it's just... I don't know, it's almost like you've been forgotten politicians for so long. Part of that, when I was first elected, we'd just been elected, and the Scottish Parliament elections obviously had, had happened as well, and first Scottish Parliament in our, whole, you know, in centuries, and um, the decision for many of the journalists who were covering the European Parliament was they were relocated back to the Scottish Parliament. So it turned out that, that after oh, maybe over a year or so, since the 1999 time, there was no, no journalists covering what we did in Brussels, nothing. And so if you wanted to cover a Brussels story, it would be up to the MEPs to let the journalists know, and that's fine, but, you know, it just, we didn't have any coverage at all, not the Herald, the Scotsman, you know, and that was so sad because there's a huge amount of stories that were going on, but we know that our press are under pressure, they don't have the money that they had before, and we want a democratic press as well, because that's important. So it's huge challenges over press, press coverage and resources. Um, but I think, you know, with, with it's 80% of people in Scotland read Scottish based press, and not one journalist covering anything that goes on there. It's actually amazing in some ways, if you want to say, how did we get 62% in a referendum actually to remain when we've not had the coverage really that could have been possible if we had people actually, I mean, you could have had actually 80% of a remain vote if you actually had more coverage. So it's, um, it's quite interesting. Thing. So, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday about state aids and part of, you know, they get the question of the this, this state aid uh, issue and you're kind of like, well, actually, if it's such the case as that, why then is railways in Germany and France under public control? How can France and Germany do it? And we can't. It was a political choice in the United Kingdom and don't blame Brussels. Then you talk about procurement. Well, I worked in the procurement policies and it was led, it was led by a guy called Mark Tarabella, who's a social democrat, and he would describe himself on the on the left. And you're thinking, the he, you know, this gentleman drove through the new public procurement rules. Um, get him to come and talk to you actually about what's happening. Because what I would say, many of the decisions that are blamed on Brussels for not being able to do things, it's an easy person to blame. In fact, it's our choice at the United Kingdom about what we do with our public policies. And so for some on the left, there is definitely, they see the European Union, I've always seen the European Union as some form of capitalist conspiracy. That is true, they have. And then some of them will remain to do so. What I would say, it's a force for good, it's a force for peace. And also, you, you know, we live in a market economy. If you want to balance that and have some, some balance, you balance it with social rights. Social rights that have been driven by the European Union. You look at Jack Delors and his speech that transformed 
how social rights were seen, and that balance, that wonderful balance of having a market economy, but balancing with social rights. And, and we're about to lose those social rights with Brexit. And I think that's maybe why the trade union movement at the moment is trying to look at this seriously, about what it's going to do at moving forward. Because those rights, when people talk about new trade arrangements, well, you can strike trade deals all you like as a third country. It's what's in those trade deals that matter. So, I mean, strike a trade deal with Mr. Trump, and then you'll have certain varieties of fun known chicken coming our way. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I jest, but I mean, it, it's pretty serious about it. Really serious about what the vision of some people, not all of them, but some people who are wanting us to leave the European Union, what their vision, particularly on the right, is one of low wages, of trickle-down economy, of making Britain some form of tax haven, and it's, it's European rules that are trying to tackle some of this stuff. Um, and I think it's interesting, isn't it, with McMaffey, and, and sorry, I know you don't watch the BBC, but one of the things I did watch in the BBC was was the, the McMaffey programme, which was very popular, but again, that's been, that book by Misha Galeni has been out for it's a decade. And you know, that information has been there. It took that BBC series for actually people to question things, and it was quite extraordinary, kind of like, how can the security minister or the treasury now be talking about these things uh, when actually, you know, you guys are Brexit people, you know? Because some of this stuff is because we're in the European Union, we can try and tackle some of it. And if you think that is bad, just think we're being outside a set, a rules-based organisation, being on our own, having to grapple to do trade agreements at any cost to our people to get a trade agreement done very quickly is not something that you at least have power. I mean, there are debates about how trade agreements and different things, and I take that, but you have more power if you're part of a group of 28 than you are, even as a large country of, what, 76 million people, you're much better off being part of a larger group than being out on your own. People you want to be in elected office. Um, but I also see people who, you know, who want to protect their own ambition, protect their own interests as well. So you can't generalize. I mean, this is the thing you can see, you know, people who are elected into politics come in at different places, different ways, different views. What I would say for some is that they are whipped as a, I mean, they are elected under a party banner. They are whipped and to break the whip has consequences as well and they're weighing up and they also many of them feel loyalty this loyalty that you're elected as part of a party as well so you're elected in a party ticket but you're elected therefore i mean i represent the whole of scotland i'm elected in a labor list if i represent the whole of scotland what did the whole of scotland do it voted to remain part of the european union 62 percent and i think that you've got responsibility to represent those interests as well as listening to but put forward the arguments about why being part of something that's bigger than you is important and the import, and the and the consequences of what is being suggested about leaving. So do you not have a party group? No, I I I was the whip of my group in the European Parliament Labour Party for three years. So we do have a whip. But the whip is very different in the European Parliament than it is at Westminster. And I think the culture at Westminster as well means that the way it works I worked at Westminster for two years. No, I wasn't elected. I worked for an MP. Um, I think people, frankly, are under a huge amount of pressure. And so um, they have to make decisions. It's not easy. And I think that's another... People aren't going in and going... I think a lot of people really are grappling with what to do with a situation where, say, in the, say their constituency voted to leave, they, are, they, are, they believe in Remain, they want to represent their constituency, but they also want to be able to kind of put forward what the consequences of this mean to the people that they're representing. It's hugely different. And also, I think some of it really comes down to how people feel about where loyalties lie and how they grapple with that too. And that is hard as well. Um, I can only speak for my, myself in that, you know, when it came to um, issues where huge amounts of pressure were put, certainly on my group and certain issues in the past, we took decisions collectively, which maybe wasn't what, the, what my government might have wanted at the time, but what now, in terms of social rights, I'm glad we did what we did. So you can 
you can stand up, but you have, I think you have to be very clear about what it is you're doing. And I think on Brexit, I wish there were more people who were clearer, who had the strength to stand up and to actually speak out against what is an act of folly. Yes. I think, I think, I think, right, I, I can't speak for the Conservative Party, but I mean, I, I can give you some comments what I think is happening, but I think that they're, they're, so, they're very divided, and that those who don't, so I, I don't understand how it's come about where that that particular viewpoint of Eurosceptics is now the dominant viewpoint, whereas it wasn't previously before. How, in that short space of time, has that happened? And I think it's down to Theresa May's weaknesses. It's also down to the various factions that are being vocal within the Conservative Party. And also, it's about them thinking about where they're going in the future. This is my, I mean, I'm not, but just observing it. So there are two MEPs I know who are really talented, really able in the Conservative Party. And now they, have, they had their whip taken away from them because they voted a different way on um, on it was an Article Fifty vote. The Article Fifty vote. Then it was Julie Gerland and one other. And now they're kind of. And they're like, these are good people. You know, surely you understand they have different. But I mean, I'm the Labour Party have, have different views. The Conservative Party have different. The SNP have different views. What thirty percent of people who voted to. I mean, there's all these statistics about what different people did in different parties. But regardless of that, these different viewpoints within the governing party at the moment is, is getting it nowhere because it's such a serious, serious issue that somehow I think some of them thought it could be easily done, you know, Brussels would cow over or all of this. Actually, when you trigger Article 50, it was written in such a way that you are the weaker party. You have no power in this real process. You will be, you know, and it was written like that by, by, by a, a, a John, what's it, John, not John Edwards, what's it, um, not Lord Kerr, who wrote it. And it was written in such a way to make sure that countries didn't, you know, kind of use this lightly. We've walked into this, we've had a general election since we triggered it, which lost us time, and we're now no further forward than we were a year ago since we instigated it. How on earth are we in this? And Boris Johnson, um, I mean, I, I hope history looks back on what he has done to our country and will say something about the damage that a group, a small group of people are doing to our country. And, and I hope that will be reflected in the future. But at the moment, I think that his ambition and other people's ambition are certainly being um, put forward in a way which is not thinking about our country's interests and they're putting their ambition first before our national interests. And really, I mean, will it boil down to us again having a situation in Northern Ireland because our, our government will not make a will, will not you know make the decisions that are needed to be made to ensure that there that there's no border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. I mean, know that the DUP want a British solution to the border. I mean, know that Sinn Féin want an Irish solution to the border. Everybody wants a solution to the border, but how are we going to get it? And at the moment, that's really unclear. And I never thought after. That negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement, how important that is. How are we here where, again, we could put peace at risk in Northern Ireland for what? For an internal debate within the Conservative Party over something that is being is so important and the government should was held up by 10 DUP MPs. So. I think that what I think. So I think that there really needs to be serious thought about the Good Friday Agreement because the Good Friday Agreement is central. Mm-hmm. And when you look at how the European Union has supported the Good Friday Agreement, certainly through peace money and through kind of which wouldn't hadn't gone before, really, really you know, really important funding. But I cannot believe that that, that we are where we are when when we all knew that Northern Ireland that, you know that, that Northern Ireland voted to remain it, it, it's you know the politics there are because you can't form a government in Northern Ireland just now they tried to was it last week it wasn't possible 
And now the current government is relying on 10 MPs' votes from one particular wing of the, the debate in, in, in Northern Ireland. Some people have been saying to me, why are Sinn Féin not taking their seats in the British, in the, in the British Parliament um, to put another point of view? But we know that's historic and that's why they don't. But I think that um, really, they, they, I mean, they need to work with the Irish government. They need to have, I, I, I would say, they probably need to, to, to focus on making that more of a political priority. But when their political time is being spent trying to navigate these different, because she's, the Prime Minister says one statement, another person contradicts her, the cabinet's all over the place, they don't know what they really want, but then they're saying they don't want the single market and the customs union, if you don't want that, what do you want? Well, that's not very clear at all. Um, so whilst they're, exp they're spending all this time and energy over one thing, they're not concentrating probably on the most important thing. She would say that they, they did try to form a government in Northern Ireland and all of that. Yes, they did. However, you need to spend and expend time and energy in trying to ensure that you solve this situation because you know it's a situation, you know it's the most problematic part. The money can be solved, citizens' rights can be solved, but the Northern Ireland issue and the border issue cannot be solved if we do not remain part of the single market. I mean, if you remain part of the single market and accustomed to you, you can solve it. If you don't, then you can't. And that's my understanding. So that's why I'm saying keep the EF option open. Keep these options open. Don't rule anything out. Do not rule anything out. If I can't be a full member of the EU, the second option is an EAF option. It's bespoke. Now, as people say, EAF was done out of a fudge because Norway said they didn't want to be part of the European Union. Okay, that is true. The EAF the EA, has been there for longer, but the EA, um agreement came about, and it's there. It might not fit everything we want, it might not be perfect, of course it is not, nothing, no government, nothing is perfect, but if we've got six months to do a negotiation, if we've got six months to do something before we have a cliff edge on the 29th of March 2019, you don't have many options open. And if we had time, you could have a different arrangement negotiate, but that would take 10 years. So, what have we got there that's there that we can use? Now, some people will say, you could use that in the transition, and then possibly you might think about a different relationship and all of these things, but the clock is ticking. We're short in time. But the situation in Northern Ireland, which I think is one which, yeah, you, I mean, part of you is right that it could be that, but it stops everything and all of that. The more likely thing that will happen is it will have another general election before we even get to that stage because things will fall apart at Westminster. And it looks as though, you know, things could, I mean, that is a possibility when things come to, 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 to be voted upon and you look at the reality and the numbers are really, really tight. Even with some support from the different factions of different parties or whatever, it comes to a vote. I mean, look at the last vote, there's what, three votes in it that, that, that changed it. So, a lot can happen from now until then. So, I'm not convinced it will entirely be, I mean, that's an issue and it is something that needs to be solved in order that peace can still be there. In the, and, I mean, we don't hear about some of the violent actions that happen on a week to week basis. And there is still an undercurrent there which is, is, is troubling and one which will just, if, if everything falls apart, it will be hugely problematic for, for, for peace to, to continue. Sorry, again, this is so depressing, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't want peace, I, I, I don't want peace to end anywhere, I want peace to continue, you know, so. It's so sad, isn't it, that in Northern Ireland you can't, I mean, as I say, the DUP want a British solution to the border, the Sinn Féin want an Irish solution to the border. Everyone wants a solution to the border. The solution is really not to leave the European Union, but if you're going to leave the European Union, then having some yeah, issue about single market and customs union has to remain on the table. Um, so that's where I think that we need to keep that debate. I mean, something you should actually invite to your... Katie, Katie Hubert is the academic from Queen's Belfast, who's the expert on borders. 
Um, she came to talk, Carolyn, were you there in, in Glasgow University? She came to talk at Glasgow University. The, it was the Parliament, I thought it was a Parliament, maybe it's just the Parliament, not the Commission, but the Parliament organised an event which was, um, it was like the Politics Society of the UK were meeting Glasgow University and there was a sponsored event and I was one speaker and there's a, uh, um, Francis um, who used to run the Irish office for the, you know, so it was a really good debate and she was excellent and she's being used a lot and I just think, I think the Irish issue, people need to get their head around what, and having an expert like her who's accessible, in the Scottish Parliament when they were in um, the External Affairs Committee was in Belfast, I think they were also in Dublin, but I think they were in Belfast and they had people from Queen's University of Belfast there and she's just excellent. So it's just, I think that, you know, getting people who can come and talk and explain Quite, quite tricky issues, um, but I mean, she look at it, and, and you can follow her on Twitter as well. And she made a really good comment about customs unions, and it was really, really it was top notch. So she's somebody follow on Twitter. Look at what she's saying about border issues because she's neutral and she's not got any. Katie is it Katie Hayward from? She's a doc, she's, she's a, a lecturer at Queen's Belfast. Um, love, really great person, and really worth engaging with. And if she's back in Scotland, get her to come talk to your group because she, she'd be great, she'd be really good. What can I, what can I, and how can I answer your question when I feel your frustrations and I'm trying to put forward to those who are making those decisions that you, if you're coming out of the European Union, you have to keep every option open. There's no such thing as a jobs first Brexit. A Brexit means job losses full stop. Um, I will never use that line that seems to be being used. Um, and also just, I want to see the Labour Party standing up against this hard Brexit. Hard Brexit is a choice. And the British Prime Minister is making that choice based on purely her own party pressures. Because you could choose to be part of the EFTA, you can choose to think about about the re relationship around around that, and somehow we're ruling that out. And I think that is really that's a poor judgment when you need to keep every single option open to ensure your country is not left at a cliff edge on the 29th of March 2019. But I will keep pressurising those in my party who are taking, shall we, shall we say, a weak position on what should be much cleaner. And I think that people. You know, the more people put pressure on Jeremy Corbyn to change his position, I think that's happening and I think that has to be a good thing because if he would come out and be much clearer about what his views are in terms of making sure that people's jobs are protected, that people's livelihoods are protected and that Brexit, we should put the brakes in Brexit, I think it would be really impactful. Mm -hmm. But all I can do is say I will keep putting pressure on him mm -hmm. because that's the only thing I can do as a pro-European, anti-Brexit politician who wants to see the party change their policy, but, which has changed from when, you know, it's so dramatically changed that I feel that, you know, we can take a step back and we can say we want to put the brakes on Brexit and legitimately put that forward in our national interest. I think, this is a positive note, I think that is actually happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. and I think that's a huge, that, that's, that, that has to be welcomed and that is why on some of these votes where it was very close, that behind the scenes working was very, very effective. But we're going to have to see more of that because really, where we're moving to with this March meeting of the heads of government, with the lack of clarity of what the UK government is wanting. And you know, each time some of these votes come up, the majorities, depending on the issue, will, will, will be absolutely critical. And that's why, you know, what is going to happen at, at, the, at, at Westminster in the weeks ahead um, is really, is, is one that we've got to keep the pressure on and keep supporting those who will not support their party whip on this issue because it's so important to our national interest. So I think um, I'm not a Westminster. I kind of, what, what I find interesting um, when I've spoken to MPs privately is that I think 
there's a clear understanding that being part of the single market and the customs union is important. There's a clear understanding amongst many of them who voted to remain. This is not a situation they wanted at all. And they, they, they know that this is not a good situation that our country is in. And everyone, if Brexit is going to happen, and that's a question mark in itself, but if it is going to happen, what are the different scenarios? And one scenario has to be the single market and customs union. It has to be an EAFTA, and I say EA, you're not in the customs union, but you're in the single market. That has to be on the table it's because we need to have that market access in order for, for jobs to be able to survive post Brexit Britain. Thank you. Thank you.